On Monday, SpaceX announced that it would launch four private individuals on a Crew Dragon capsule into an orbit around the Earth. The mission, known as Inspiration4, seeks to raise support for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Jared Isaacman, founder and CEO of Shift4 Payments and a trained pilot, is donating the three seats alongside him to individuals from the general public who will be announced in the weeks ahead. One of the seats is reserved for a St. Jude ambassador with direct ties to the mission. The third and fourth crew seats will be decided by online competitions listed on the Inspiration4 website. The third seat is open to any adult U.S. citizen who donates to St. Jude Hospital during the month of February, while the fourth is open to customers of the Shift4 Shop e-commerce platform. The mission, commanded by Jared Isaacman, will launch from Launch Pad 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida atop a Falcon 9 rocket. SpaceX plans to use the Crew Dragon spacecraft named Resilience, which is currently docked with the International Space Station for the mission. Prior to flight, crew members will get special training from SpaceX with a specific focus on orbital mechanics, operating in microgravity, and other forms of stress testing. The four-person crew will spend up to five days in the Crew Dragon capsule as it orbits Earth along a customized flight path. The mission is scheduled to launch in the fourth quarter of 2021. NASA has delayed its plan to award two high-profile crewed lunar lander contracts from February to April. Last year, SpaceX, Blue Origin, and Inetics were granted a combined $967 million in funding to develop concepts for a human lunar landing system. SpaceX bid its next-generation spacecraft, Starship, which the company has been developing in South Texas for the last few years. SpaceX's chunk of development funds was $135 million. Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin was awarded a sum of $579 million to develop its Blue Moon lander. The company announced a national team in 2019, comprising Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and Draper to work on the project. Dynetics got $253 million for its human landing system and has partnered with Sierra Nevada Corporation. Both Blue Origin and Dynetics are planning to launch their mission on the United Launch Alliance's new Vulcan rocket, which is currently under development. NASA had previously intended to choose two out of these three lunar landing systems to carry humans back to the moon. But last month, NASA told the three contractors that an extension to their development contracts will be required and picked a new award date of April 30. According to NASA, the delay is designed to give it more time to evaluate the bidder's proposals. Also, the extension will give the companies more time to design and develop their lander systems. The delay comes after Congress passed a spending bill in December, awarding NASA $850 million for the Human Landing System program. The award is a massive cut compared to the $3.2 billion required to meet the 2024 timeline set before. With this massive cut in the budget, the long-term fate of the Artemis program is uncertain. But NASA has said that it is still committed to the 2024 timeline to return to the moon. In September 2020, a team led by astronomers in the United Kingdom announced that they had detected the chemical phosphine in the thick clouds of Venus. The researchers made the detection using the Atacama Large Millimeter Array Observatory in Chile and the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope in Hawaii. The radio data showed that light was being absorbed at millimeter wavelengths, which corresponded to a phosphine concentration of 20 parts per billion in the atmosphere. Phosphine, a toxic compound of hydrogen and phosphorus, is a possible signature for life on other planets, and it is made by some organisms on Earth. Researchers have suggested that, in the region of the atmosphere where phosphine was found, is away from the crushing pressures and scorching temperatures of the planet's surface, where some airborne microbes could survive. Since the publication of the 2020 findings, several studies have challenged the report. Recently, a team of astrobiologists at the University of Washington, led by Victoria Meadows, analyzed data from one of the telescopes used to make the phosphine claim and could not detect the gas's spectral signature. The scientists calculated how gases would behave in Venus's atmosphere and concluded that what the original team thought was phosphine is actually sulfur dioxide, a gas that is common on Venus and is not a sign of possible life. The authors suggested the radio telescopes used by the original researchers were configured in a way that it diluted the signal from sulfur dioxide, making it seem like there was less of it in the Venusian atmosphere. 
Ultimately more research is needed to resolve the debate, and the astronomers are planning to conduct fresh observations of Venus in the coming months and years. A US company that's developing a rocket to propel small satellites into space passed its first major test on January 31. The Brunswick-based startup BlueShift Aerospace launched its 6-meter tall prototype rocket, called Stardust 1.0, hitting an altitude of a little more than 1,200 meters, in a flight designed to test the rocket's propulsion and control systems. The mission carried a science project by Falmouth High School students to measure flight metrics such as barometric pressure. The payload also included a special alloy that's being tested by a New Hampshire company and a Dutch dessert called Stroopwafel, in an homage to its Amsterdam-based parent company. Organizers of the launch said the items were included to demonstrate the inclusion of a small payload. This mission was the first ever commercial rocket launch, powered by a bio-derived hybrid rocket engine. The engine relies on solid fuel and a liquid oxidizer passing through or around the solid fuel for propulsion. BlueShift's rocket engine uses a proprietary solid biofuel that the company says is non-toxic, carbon neutral, and can be cheaply sourced from farms across America. It uses nitrous oxide bubbled with oxygen as an oxidizer. The goal of BlueShift Aerospace is to create a small rocket that could launch a 30-kilogram payload into low Earth orbit, more than 160 kilometers above the Earth's surface. The company plans to begin orbital launches by early 2024. Just one week after setting a world record for the most number of satellites launched in a single mission, SpaceX had notched a booster reusability milestone last week. On February 4, the two-stage Falcon 9 rocket that lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida marked the fastest turnaround to date for any rocket. Two and a half minutes after liftoff, the Falcon 9 booster B1060, launching twice in just 27 days, got separated from the first stage to begin its journey back to Earth. Approximately six minutes later, the rocket's first stage landed on one of SpaceX's drone ships in the Atlantic Ocean, in a smooth touchdown. It was the fifth successful landing for this Falcon 9 first stage booster. 65 minutes after liftoff, the 60 Starlink satellites separated from the second stage of the rocket and entered into an orbit around the Earth, marking the completion of the mission. Now, let's discuss the major Starship updates from the past week. Ending more than a week of delays and a significant FAA licensing issue, Starship Serial No. 9 lifted off from Starship Launch Pad B on February 2. The three sea-level Raptor engines of SN9, capable of producing a combined maximum thrust of 6,600 kilonewtons, powered the vehicle to a height of 10 kilometers on its maiden high-altitude test flight. About 33 seconds after liftoff, a flame puff appeared behind the Raptor engine serial number 49, but it quickly burned away. The commentator confirmed that everything is performing as expected, and the vehicle continued to climb to its apogee. Like its predecessor SN8, at about 100 seconds after liftoff, one of the three Raptor engines of SN9 shut down and gimbled out of the way to allow the other two engines as much space possible. Another two minutes after that, one of the remaining Raptors also got shut down and gimbles out, leaving one engine active. That one engine continued to burn for another 90 seconds, producing just enough thrust to lift the vehicle to its apogee. The shutdown of engines one by one created asymmetric thrust, causing the vehicle to slowly turn sideways. About one minute later, the active Raptor engine began throttling down, and the vehicle started venting the excess liquid oxygen to ready the vehicle for flip maneuver. Finally, at 4 minutes and 34 seconds after liftoff, before its shutdown, Raptor serial number 49 gave the Starship a gentle push needed to swing it to horizontal. Cold gas nitrogen thrusters, along with forward and aft fins, carefully controlled the Starship and brought it horizontal to begin the belly flop maneuver. Compared to SN8, serial number 9 overshot a little bit during the flip, making the nose go down slightly. But the fins and gas thrusters worked together to bring the vehicle back to horizontal. The vehicle then spent around 90 seconds in freefall, controlling itself using four large flaps and shedding velocity through aerodynamic drag. At a height of about 200 meters, SN9 attempted to ignite two of its three Raptors to flip around and slow down for a soft landing. Things went wrong from here on. One of the Raptors spluttered in its attempt to relight, while the other carried out a smooth and steady ignition, 
producing beautiful mock diamonds. With just half the thrust needed available to the rocket, Starship SN9 could not flip or slow down properly and impacted the ground at significant speed, destroying its propellant tanks and causing a massive explosion. Starship SN8, which exploded during its landing attempt last month, had low pressure in the methane header tank during the landing burn. Even though SpaceX fixed this issue ahead of SN9's flight, they faced a new problem with reignition, resulting in the loss of their test vehicle. Fortunately, the failed landing of the Starship SN9 was very precise, sparing the SpaceX launch facilities and Starship serial number 10 standing next to it. After a series of inspections to ensure the vehicle is unharmed, followed by ground tests and static fires, SN10 could be ready to fly before the end of this month. Ahead of the test series, Raptor engines labeled serial number 39 and 50 were installed on the vehicle last week. In a recent public notice, Cameron County ordered to temporarily close State Highway 4 and Boca Chica Beach from February 8 to 12. SpaceX will conduct the cryogenic pressure tests and static fire of SN10 during these days. Unlike SN8, whose nose cone was partially intact after the explosive landing, SN9 got completely shattered during the explosion. SpaceX is currently removing the debris of the blast and is cleaning the launch facilities and surroundings. Two days after the flight of SN9, Elon Musk shared more details of Starship SN9's flight test on Twitter. Initially, jokingly, he said that SpaceX and himself were too dumb not to light all three Raptors before the final flip, and then pick the best two and turn off the other. Later he added that, it was foolish not to start three engines and immediately shut down one, as only two are needed to land. A Twitter user asked Musk if it would be safer to use three engines upon descent. In his reply, he said, yes, but engines have a minimum throttle point where there is flame out risk. So, landing on three engines means high thrust to weight ratio, which is also risky. He added that, by default, the engine with the least lever arm would shut down, if all three are good. This means that the leeward Raptor should shut down, as it has the least lever arm, and it would take much effort for that engine to reorient the Starship, compared to the other two engines. He also added that SpaceX would implement these changes into the test flight of SN10. According to him, the ship's landing burn has a clear solution, and his greatest concern is achieving good payload to orbit, with rapid and full reusability. Meanwhile, on Thursday, Starship test tank SN7.2, which is currently on a test stand at the Starship launch site, attempted a pressurization to failure test. The test involved filling the tank with cryogenic liquid for pressurizing the tank to the limit. Long into the test, just as the tank was fully loaded and being pressured, a small burst developed on the side, spilling out all the cryogenic liquid used to pressurize the tank. It is currently unclear if the burst will be patched for further pressure tests. Watch our previous video to know more about the 7.2 test tank in detail. Link in the description. Now, let's take a look at the current status of various Starship prototypes, with the help of this illustration from Brendan Lewis. Last Friday, the fully stacked thrust section of Starship serial number 11 was moved from mid-bay to high bay. Nose cone assembly and aft fin installation of SN11 will commence inside the high bay this week. The forward dome of serial number 15 got mated with the common dome section inside the mid-bay last week. New parts of serial number 16 were spotted at the construction site last week. This includes the nose cone barrel section, the completely sleeved aft dome section, and the engine skirt. The forward dome of serial number 17 and 18 was also spotted at the build site last week. Forward dome of Starship serves as the top of the methane tank. Watch our previous videos in the playlist to get updates about the remaining Starship prototypes. Link in the description. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.